Okay, uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for being so prompt and uh, uh, coming back from coffee. Uh, welcome to the uh, inaugural uh, Digital Entrepreneurs Stage uh, here at uh, Digital 15, so one of our, our key uh, uh, four th uh, themed areas. Uh, the content is, in this room really is designed to give you insights, allow you to ask questions, get answers from people who've done it for real and from people who are doing it for real and who are engaged in uh, uh, many aspects of uh, entrepreneurship. This particular forum is aimed at funding and I'm delighted to welcome the, uh, uh, the chair of the panel here this morning, uh, Simon Gibson of uh, Alacrity. Uh, Simon, I think you might well know. I'll uh, ask him now to pick up the mic and introduce himself uh, to you and also to introduce uh, members of the panel. Uh, with that, Simon, over to you. Thank you oh, well, good morning. My name is Simon Gibson, and I suppose the reason I'm here is I'm Terry's, uh, Terry Matthews' uh, partner. And uh, between us, we've now done uh, 107 startups. We've generated 13.5 billion in returns. Um, and I suppose more interestingly, perhaps, we're, we are poachers turned gamekeepers in as much as we built companies ourselves before we started to help other people do it. My last company was Ubiquity. Just as a reminder, it was started on £40,000 of, of uh, seed capital. We then raised 112000 then 600000 topped it up with another 500000 and then went out for institutional money and raised at the time 25.7 million pounds of, of uh, venture capital, which I believe was the largest uh, venture round in software that had ever been done in Europe. Autonomy beat us eventually, so uh, that was good, good, a good company to go out with. Um, and I, I've got to say I'm delighted that we've got such a, a good panel here this morning. Last week I hosted the Interaction Council, which is a forum of former world leaders. And over three days, we debated a number of issues. One was the state of the world, Islamic terrorism, and ISIS. On day two, we talked about the um, global pandemics and uh, the world's response to Ebola. And on the third day, we discussed the Ukraine-Russian crisis with Zubkov, the Russian prime minister, and uh, Yushchenko, the, 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 remember the Ukrainian president who was poisoned. And over three and a half arduous hours, we tried to uh, get the two parties to come together. I rather suspect if we can do that last week, this is a piece of cake. <laughs> so what I'd like to do is each, uh, ask each of the panel members to do for you what they generally ask you to do for them, which is to introduce themselves one at a time at the lectern, tell us what they do and the companies that they're representing and the organizations that they're representing and why you should care, which is generally what they always ask of you. So if I could ask uh, someone to volunteer to go first. Thank you. Good morning. Um, my name is Kieran Garvey. I work with Crowdcube, which is the world's first and leading equity crowdfunding platform. My role at Crowdcube is to head up partnerships, so I work with various different organizations that are working with businesses looking to raise investment. So Crowdcube, we started in 2011, and as I said, we were the world's first equity crowdfunding platform. To date, we've raised 83 million for over 250 businesses throughout the UK, uh, looking to raise anywhere from 20,000 up to several million. We really, really aim to be as sector agnostic as possible, so we're funding businesses across a wide range of different areas, and as I said, across very, very early stage, right at the conception, all the way up to very, very uh, fast-growing companies looking to raise many millions. Um, we are operating throughout the UK. We're also um, increasingly looking overseas as well, so uh, we're currently operating in Spain and Portugal. Um, and also have other international ambitions as well. Um, so, yes, we're primarily an equity-focused platform, helping entrepreneurs raise money from 170,000 investors, and increasingly we're seeing this alongside the more traditional source of investment, so alongside angels and VCs. And those entrepreneurs that really see and embrace crowdfunding as a way to kind of combine their funding strategy, so taking or exploring opportunities for grants, exploring angel investment, exploring 
VC, corporate finance, and then combining that with the crowd makes for a very, very uh, well, a fantastic way to raise investment and one that we're seeing time and again that's been very, very successful. So really looking forward to hearing your questions and hopefully uh, we will have some interesting answers for you. Thank you. Before David uh, comes on, could I remind you that you can post questions for the panel on the app that many of you may have downloaded. And I think the app will also allow you to, to rank uh, other people's questions as well. Thank you. David? Good morning, everybody. Uh, David Notley from Impact Innovation. Uh, my background is in venture capital. Uh, I ran an early stage fund called the Technology Growth Fund for, for a number of years. And from there, I um, set up a couple of companies myself and invested in a few, exited from some as well. Um, most of my work is in sort of corporate finance, uh, supporting companies, helping them to become investor ready. Um, one of the things that we're doing at the moment is we're running a program for the Welsh Government called the Accelerated Growth Program. So that's running over the next six years. We're looking for a thousand ambitious, high growth, export orientated uh, Welsh companies to join the program and benefit from a range of services from uh, coaching and mentoring from uh, experienced entrepreneurs uh, through to um, facilitation of uh, professional advisory services from people like KPMG, Santander, Capital Law, uh, and there's various other networking and uh, collaborative opportunities around that. Um, one of the big things that we do with the Accelerated Growth Program is try and help people to become investor ready. So we try and facilitate the appropriate uh, investment uh, opportunities for companies and help businesses to think in terms of their investment roadmap. Uh, one of the things that I think uh, a lot of companies could do, could benefit from is thinking a bit more strategically about how they go about raising funding. So in part, that's our job. So uh, if there are ambitious, high growth, export oriented businesses here today, then we'd be happy to help you through the Accelerated Growth Program. Thank you. Thank you. Mark? Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Mark Johnson from Knowledge Transfer Network. Um, Knowledge Transfer Network is basically, uh, we bill ourselves as the UK's innovation network. We're active across a large number of, uh, of areas from everything from kind of creative digital design, which is the team that I'm part of, through to space, aeronautics, transport, high value manufacturing, biotech, e-health, sustainability. Um, you kind of name it in terms of kind of innovation and we likely have a, a sort of team who are working actively on it. Um, our role in terms of kind of working um, with sort of digital innovators is around kind of finding um, sort of interesting people doing interesting things and then working out how we best help them. There are a number of mechanisms um, that we use to do that. Some are through government funded um, projects such as collaborative R and D fund, which funds um, projects, you know, sort of tune of, you know, sort of millions of pounds kind of investment in terms of looking at very interesting kind of areas where we think technology or digital is kind of ripe for innovation and then bringing together parties to do that. We also work um, very closely with Innovate UK to scope out funding calls and advise on that. So areas of interest at the moment are uh, wearable technology, e-health, we're doing work with advertising technology and a large number of other areas. Um, we're also on the lookout for um, people doing things that aren't within those categories that we have active calls for. Um, and there are a number of kind of ways in which we can kind of help just in terms of, you know, pointing towards government funding or connecting up with venture capital funding. So um, I guess my pitch to you this morning is if you have something that falls outside the kind of usual suspects or the active calls that are out there and the things you know about, come and talk to us anyway. It's very likely that we know someone who is active in the space that you're active in and we'd like nothing more than kind of to have a conversation, work out where the best fit is and see if we can kind of connect you up. So looking forward to taking your questions and yeah, thank you. James? Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is James Henderson. Uh, I work for Finance Wales. Specifically, I manage the Technology Seed Fund uh, within Finance Wales. Uh, it's a £7.5 million pound fund, uh, which was launched just over a year ago. Uh, we've uh, so far invested £1 million pounds from it. Um, typically, we look to make uh, investments of around £150,000, um, equity investments, as you'd imagine. Um, 
we're running at about a deal every month or two at the moment. Uh, so, uh, so we're keen to talk to anyone that uh, is looking for investment in that range. Um, uh, t technology specific is, is a preference, but we don't really have any sector um, preference. We're, we're, we're generalists. Um, so uh, if you think you have uh, a business idea um, that, that you'd like to, to, to expand on and commercialize, then come and have a, a chat with us. We, uh, we have networks that we can introduce you uh, to, to various experts that can help you bring, bring that um, idea on uh, and take it to market. Um, look forward to having some questions from you uh, shortly. Thanks. Thank you. Hello, uh, Garen Green from the uh, Welsh European Funding Office. Um, clues in the title, um, the offer today is, is around European funding. Um, key points I want to make today is, is just that we're, we're trying really to build a stairway to excellence with, with European funding. So I have two roles. I'm involved in structural funds, which you may have heard about, uh, ERDF, ESF, things, things like that which have a, a specific um, requirement around them, and it's often schemes such as uh, the Accelerated Growth Programme that are supported by us in order to help you as businesses. But what we're looking to do is that we're looking to integrate that support alongside other opportunities, other European opportunities, and Horizon 2020 is my other hat. As a head of the uh, small Horizon 2020 unit in the Welsh Government, I'm looking to, to, to create an ambition in Wales where we're looking to to move businesses and Welsh organisations such as universities and research organisations along a pathway that will mean that they are able to compete on a European level and access the large amount of funding. The headline there is £79 billion. That's, that's not available today. Uh, I don't have it in my pocket, but it, it is something that uh, we're looking to raise the game in Wales and, and move, move um, businesses uh, like yourselves forward to, uh, in the future. So I think there's uh, key points there. It's a specific opportunity arose in 2020. I think it's something that I'd like you to start, walk away from here thinking, maybe I should start thinking about building that into my business strategy. Maybe not now, but maybe in the future. Uh, also, is, is it worth, uh, through, through links such as the KTN, uh, who are also engaged in this, that there's maybe some quick wins there. There may be some opportunities through an existing collaboration that's building and you could go along for the ride. Or it might be that there's a specific uh, call, because uh, it operates on a call basis, that you might be able to access. It all depends on, on the technology and uh, the fit that, that you may have with, with what partners are looking for, what you may, may be able to offer the call, and Europe and <coughs> attract some money. Sorry. We also have a small grant scheme called Score Cymru, which will support you on a journey, literally through travel to Europe, uh, to, to start to scope out some of these networks, and also uh, for, for bid writing to, to pitch into this uh, very competitive fund. Um, and, and the key message as well is, okay, it is very competitive, you might not get the money at the end of it, but what you'll find is you've developed uh, a series of networks that may help you develop in the future as a business. So a long-term gain is what I'm trying to pitch here today. Thank you very much. <laughs> Just a really general question to kick off with. Uh, what do you gentlemen look for in a winner? What's your selection criteria? And perhaps I'll kick it off by saying that I think when you're doing startups, and I mean absolutely seed, you've got nothing to work with. Except a, so you can't. What I'm saying is you you can't model something in a, in a seed situation because something might not even exist. And I've always said it's a sensory perception of head, heart, and gut. Your head will tell you about the idea and whether it's good. Your heart will tell you about the people, and your gut will tell you about the marketplace. And if the three align, you should keep talking. Now, interestingly, the only one I've ever found that could be out of alignment is the idea. I can tell you of lots of examples where someone's come to us with what could be best described as a wonky idea, but they're great people and they're in a really good marketplace. So if you can just align that idea to a better place, you've got a winner. But what I have found is you, you haven't got enough time to change the people if they're wrong, and you certainly won't be able to move the market unless you're exceptional and you're, you're an entity like Google. And I can tell you an example of that, the Van Summeren brothers who had a company in Cambridge called Encypher. 
Uh, Alex now um, is at Amadeus, the, the venture fund in Cambridge. They came to us with an idea to produce a, a browser. They had an, they had a, an agreement with uh, Oracle, uh, and it looked really good. And you'd say they'd lined up all the ducks, but the problem is, you know, I said to my colleague Roger Maggs at the time, don't touch this with a barge pole, because no one's ever going to make any money on browsers now. Because I knew what was going on in Redmond with Explorer. Um, so we went back in, and I have to say, Roger did the most strange thing I've ever seen a venture capitalist do, which is we told them we weren't going to back them because the idea was wonky, and we explained why. But we said, Nico particularly, uh, uh, Alex's brother, was a cryptologist with a PhD, and we said to him, why don't you solve some of the crypto issues of the net? And Roger pulled out a checkbook and gave him a check for £25,000 without a contract and said, that should keep you going for six months. Now come back with a solution. That became in Cypher, which was listed on the London Stock Exchange, and I think in the end, uh, IBM bought them. Um, slightly unconventional way of doing things, I know, but uh, it, uh, I think that's a, a demonstration of kind of, you know, we saw those three things align once I had the right idea, and it was investable. I was in Ireland last week, and I asked uh, a guy who was doing a PhD, in, and his dissertation was around what makes a successful SME. And, he, and I wrote down his list, and he said, they need to have a viable product or service. By the way, he'd polled 250 companies to establish you know, the ones that succeeded and why they succeeded, which is an interesting piece of work. Uh, a viable product or service, and it's kind of, all this stuff's kind of obvious, but it's nice to see it written down. Sales revenue growth and customer traction. Demonstrate an ability to manage cash flow. Having adequate funding. Getting it right first time. And the ability to attract a good team. So let's throw it over to the panel now and just ask you know, whether they've got uh, any insight to add on, on their experience um, or whether they've got any case studies they'd like to share with us. Particularly interested as well in the new phenomenon of, of uh, crowdfunding and how the crowd identifies a good idea and how that, uh, uh, you know, that ends up in a funding uh, reaction and, and how, that, um, how you create momentum in crowdfunding. Would you like to talk to that? I think you've touched on a lot of things that we are looking at when we're kind of screening the businesses that approach us. So for every 100 businesses that, that approach Crowdcube, we will unfortunately turn down about 80 to 85 percent of them. Of the 15 or 20 percent that get onto the platform, about a third to 40 percent will get funded. So you're looking about kind of five, six percent success rate overall. Um, we've got a few different kind of stages to how we're filtering the businesses that are approaching us or being introduced to us. Um, so we definitely will be looking very closely at the team, their experience, track record to date, ideally kind of previous exits if possible, um, just to demonstrate they've kind of been there, done it, and able to do it again, which in most cases is not the case, but um, obviously it's something that, that does stand out when we see that. Um, we're also going to be looking at the other team members, the market that they're operating, and of course, um, we'd look into their kind of financial track record, any kind of outstanding debts, really don't want our investors' money being used to, to, yeah, to basically pay off debts rather than focusing on growing and developing their business. Um, we'll ask them to propose their kind of initial valuation um, and really importantly that they have some flexibility with that as well so that they are coming from a point where we can negotiate from. Um, so yeah, I think... Uh, I guess final point I'd maybe make is one of the key things to a really successful crowdfunding campaign is to treat it as a blended funding exercise so that I think I mentioned initially being able to, to get some lead investors, whether or not they be uh, lead angels or perhaps a VC, um, so that you've got maybe 30, 40 or even 50 percent of your investment already secured and then you basically use the crowdfunding platform and our investor base of, as I said, 170,000 to top up your round. So when you're in a situation where you've, you've got a substantial amount of your investment, you can basically leverage that in order to, to go on to raise more money from the crowd and also use the platform as a way to basically all the investors that you're 
currently in engaging with to use the platform, put a time limit on it and say, look, this is when we're going to be going live. This is your opportunity to be part of the investment and basically put a time stopper on it rather than letting those conversations kind of roll on for months and months and months, which anecdotally is a story that we hear all the time from entrepreneurs. So just really putting that that timestamp on it can help you close the investors you're speaking to. And also our investors like to see that you've managed to get other investors on board. So, Thank you. Anyone else want to comment? Um, yeah, I mean, I think there's some common themes developing here, isn't there? Um, so picking up on the points that uh, have been mentioned already, um, I mean, the one thing that I always observe is that actually good ideas are 10 a penny. Um, there's lots of good ideas out there. Uh, and the difference between a good idea and a successful business is actually execution. Um, so we're looking for people that recognize that um, and actually building on, on, on these themes here, you know, teams as well. I think that's important. I think in, well, it's always been really hard if you're on your own, but I think in the current climate, in the current environment, in, in complex international global technology marketplaces, being a sole entrepreneur is a lonely place to be. So I, I generally look for people who are working in, you know, small teams, but but teams, you know, where they're looking to to actually try and uh, work together to, to, to execute well. Um, I think the other thing that, that we look for is, is a recognition that ultimately you've got to be able to validate what you're, what you're saying. Uh, again, it's, having a great idea is brilliant, but you've got to be able to demonstrate that someone's prepared to check, get their checkbook out and pay for it. Um, so anything that can be done to validate what you're saying about your, your product, your technology, your idea, your business model, all of those things are really important. And that can be done in a number of ways. The best way, obviously, is, is paying customers, but it can be done in others, other ways as well. So I think you know, trying to um, ensure that your proposition has market validation, that it's market-led, um, that this is something that, uh, that people are actually going to want to buy. And that's a really key part, I think, of, of the whole proposition. Thank you. James? I think the only thing I would add to that, um, just, well, two things really. Uh, I think firstly, um, passion is very important from a, from a founder. I think you, within a minute or two of meeting somebody, you get a, a feel for, for whether it's something they, they truly believe in or whether they're just kind of going through the motions because they haven't got anything better to do. And I think um, seeing, seeing passion and true passion from a founder is really important. I think the second thing, um, the term USP is banded around uh, quite frequently. Um, it's very rarely do you see a true USP. And I think, um, you know, that, that is very important. If, you've got, if you have a very strong differentiator in your business, uh, coupled with, with passion to, to commercialize it, I think that's, that's quite a powerful combination. Um, so, so those two things together are quite key, uh, certainly from my perspective anyway. Thank you. Um, I'd like to just, before we throw it open to the audience, talk about debt versus equity and why venture capitalists often demand both. And um, I suppose, look at the morality of preference shares and the fact that uh, often a VC will do an investment, they'll want to double out on top of everybody else. So in other words, they'll get their money out first, and sometimes they want twice their money out first, plus um, they get pro rata on what's left, and they're putting a coupon on their money uh, to get a return. And you can understand why uh, some founders get quite agitated by this. Uh, and at the end of the day, often get to a point where it's not worth their while anymore. The worst I've seen is a triple out and a 22% coupon on the money. I suggested to the people they're probably better off borrowing it on Wonga. Um, I'm just interested why people would do that. Um, I can honestly tell you that Wesley Clover only invests in ordinary shares. Uh, and we've done very well. Our history is... 777, typically we're in an investment for seven years, our return is seven times, and the average amount of money we've got to put into a company is seven million. Um, they're not bad returns. If you, and by the way, I whipped Newbridge out of there, because Newbridge was a 10.8 billion exit, so that distorts the numbers badly, but even it's beyond that. So I'm just interested why, if any of the, if, if any of the panel want to take that one on, why VCs can be so obnoxious in terms of their terms. David, do you want to do that one? 
Well, VCs are inher inherently greedy. I think that's what it, what it is. No, I mean, I think basically VCs have a, have a, have a tough business model. Um, they want to have their cake and eat it. I saw a, a good stat the other day looking at um, Silicon Valley um, investments over the last 30 years. And if you look at uh, the investments that have been made over that time period in early stage and, and sort of technology-based businesses, only 7% of the businesses that received money made a 10 times return. Um, so it's a tough business to be in. I mean, that's the reality of it. And spotting winners, particularly early on, is not an easy thing to do. So I think, I think VCs are often trying to just hedge their bets. That, yeah, but that's, it's, that's it's gouging it. the companies that are good the answer to the, the problem. Probably not, um, but there's a huge temptation when you've got pressure from your investors in turn to try and structure a deal that covers every single base you can possibly imagine. Um, mm. But but I, I, I agree. I mean, I think ultimately the simpler the better. And, and one of the things that you observe when you work with companies uh, who are trying to raise money is that VCs often expect business owners to be experts in finance. And of course they're not. You know, it is often the first time that they've had exposure to these kinds of issues. Um, and particularly for startup and early stage businesses, keep it simple. You yeah. know, don't need to make it complicated. If you make it complicated, then in, in, in the end, that's to, to probably everybody's... Um, the irony of it is, of course, is that as soon as you do your next round, all the terms are thrown out the window anyway. Well, that, that often is the case. And, and, and the next round is always the most important round yeah. uh, because that's, that's where the power lies. Um, so I think, I think there's a very real challenge there. I mean, I think if, if you know, one thing that I would say, um, if you are looking to raise funding, is always push back. You know, there's a temptation to believe that this is the big bad VC and you've kind of got to do what they say. But ultimately, you know, it's a negotiation. It's not, it's not a set deal. You know, if, you go, if you're going to a bank and, and you're going through the T's and C's, then that might be tricky. But with a VC, everything's up for grabs. I think it's a balance, isn't it, between not marrying the first... Uh, not, you know, marrying the first girl you kiss, but also not being an entrepreneur either, and you've got to kind of get that balance right between I, I, the I think you, you kind of have to have the mindset as well that, that, that actually venture capitalists, all capital, is looking for opportunities. You know, it's their job to find the best opportunities, and so they're lucky to invest in you. So, you know, if you have that kind of mindset, then that helps, I think, to be a bit more robust. Yeah, I think the other thing to add is the, the co-investment perspective. Uh, from Finance Wales's perspective, we do rely on, on an angel, the skill set that an angel would bring to it. So um, it's not just the founder that would be put off by, by the preference share. It, it's scaring away some, some um, strategic uh, co-investors. So I think um, absolutely you know, ma making it as, uh, as easy as possible to attract the, the full round of funding is important. Okay, I mean, moving on, let's just have a quick discussion about failure. A uh, really good report just come out from the Silicon Valley Association. Uh, and everyone would look to Silicon Valley and say it's the most uh, dynamic environment in the world, which it is for all sorts of reasons, in terms of you know, funding support and uh, science and technology and exploitation, commercialization and innovation. 3,000 companies last year were formed in the Valley. 2,400 failed. 600 succeeded. Now, we only ever see the news around the 600, but we don't see the carnage around the 2,400. But I can guarantee you that a lot of those 2,400 will be up and running again within, within a few months. Why is it, particularly in the Welsh culture, if you fail, you're stigmatised for the rest of your life? Anyone want to take that on? Um. Well, I, I, I think that's probably a, a, a British thing. Um, it may even be a European thing. It's definitely a Welsh thing. Um, you don't want to. You don't want to fail. You don't want to bet bet the farm Mind on you, something. In, in, in our culture as well, you don't want to succeed. Yeah. You know. <laughs> there may there may be that as well. I, I, I think also um, there's an issue at the other end of the scale around ambition. You know, a lot of businesses that I see that have huge global potential are actually quite coy about exploiting that. They're, they're often you know, nervous that, that, that it's actually possible for a company from Wales to become an international, globally successful business. And I, and I often have conversations with people where I say, look, if you were in Palo Alto or wherever, you'd have VCs knocking on your door saying, come on, let's get on with it. 
So um, I think there's a fear of failure, but actually, I think you're right. There's, a, there's also partly a fear of success. You know, what does that mean? What does it look like? How do I do it? Can I do it? And, and so on. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's just have a look. I, I'm, I'm, I'd like our two colleagues from uh, the government agencies, the, the KTN and WEFO, to comment. Uh, I recently went to Brussels. I met with the commissioner to talk about Horizon 2020. She made it quite plain and clear that it was not a continuation of the frameworks, which were really funding for universities and for larger companies, that it was for the reindustrialization of Europe, and it would be achieved through SMEs. Um, how many SMEs are in the room, or how many people who don't represent a large company are in the room? Okay, hands, hands up if you've ever received any money from the Commission. Could I ask what it was for? Yeah. Every time I try to get Okay. I mean, I mean, basically, um, it's a great idea. There's 80 billion euros of funding in Horizon 2020. That's 80 b billion. <coughs> Some bugger's going to get it. So why isn't it us? But of course, one of the issues is the process is so difficult. Um, Let's switch to Innovate UK, which the KTNs are part of Innovate UK. Innovate UK has a uh, six, seven hundred million a year budget yeah. for, uh, to help us as companies. We don't have a catapult in Wales. We've tried. I think they're highly political, in, 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 and I can pretty much prove that they are, if anyone's interested in that discussion. But, so we need a little bit more support from our politicians. But a friend, of, a friend of ours, many of you know him, Dylan Jones-Evans, Professor Dylan Jones-Evans, recently did a piece of work looking at the amount of money that Wales receives through Innovate UK. If you were to apply the Barnet formula, which I know is a rather blunt instrument, but it is an interesting one, uh, Innovate UK owes us 150 million. <laughs> so I'm, I'm interested to hear from, uh, from our two colleagues who represent those organisations with all this money, how... What we need to do, and I recognise, and I've spoke to Innovate UK a number of times, and they say, you know, Wales needs to better engage and has a, a better appreciation that the money's there and understand how to get it. And there's some things that are going to be announced during the, during the next couple of days. One of them is uh, Innovation Point, which is an agency being set up to help people uh, get the money, and in, particularly with bid writing, you might want to talk to that. But if I could throw that over to you. Yeah, Who wants to go first? Sorry. Would you like to go first? I'll take that one Thanks. First. <laughs> yeah, um, I think... There has been um, an issue of engagement um, coming from Wales specifically. Um, in fact, just on that note, how many um, people here from Wales? Um, okay, all right, so good. Um, okay, so there has been, I think, uh, an issue of engagement um, around Innovate UK funding um, that is understood and recognised. Um, and it's taken very seriously is, is as much as I can kind of say, I think, you know, sort of openly and publicly without getting specifics. Um, where we do recognise um, where we can help is in interventions on the ground. So I'm relatively new in post um, and uh, relatively unique in terms of the position that I occupy. So I work within the creative digital design team, but I'm based in Cardiff and I'm from Cardiff and have worked in the industry and continue to work in industry and maintain a kind of private practice. Um, the reason for putting me down here uh, with an understanding of what goes on the ground is that A, I know who's who at the zoo and we can go out there and have conversations directly on the ground but also so that we've got a kind of presence that will bubble up what is, you know, what is kind of quality and what is good down here so that we can start improving that investment and that kind of hit rate from business in Wales. And we're taking that very seriously. We've got a number of things going on around kind of um, digital sector and getting kind of sector panels and getting people pulling together as a kind of unit. Uh, we see our role there as a catalyst to help those interactions and those kind of those meetings happen so that they can benefit the communities that, you know, so some of our partners, which I, I won't kind of name publicly, the folks that they serve, which is essentially you guys, we see our role as bringing those together to A, join up some of the activity that happens around promoting the sector, but also to start improving um, what we see as kind of strike rates on things like Innovate UK funding, so collaborative R&D funding, smart funding, et cetera, et cetera, but also Horizon 2020, which has been mentioned a few times 
this morning. So, yeah, so in answer to the question, we recognise that there has been, uh, you know, an issue in the past. We are quite determined to do something about that and engage fully on the ground. So, you know, if that means you, you know, as your organisation, you in particular, then please come and speak to us. And we're working again, you know, with sort of partners in the room and, you know, a lot of people on the stage up here. We are in active partnership looking for um, businesses and projects and innovation that we can, you know, do something interesting with. And the, so, and the lovely thing about the money that Mark's organisation offer, it's often 100% funding. Um, no, not well, necessarily. So Innovate UK is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Innovate UK, it's, it's often not repayable. So there are different types of funding, um, quite a few, and probably too much to kind of get into here. Um, but certainly, uh, most of it is non-repayable. It's kind of, you know, it's kind of grant funding. Um, we encourage partnership with venture capital uh, and see that as a kind of really good validation of what people are trying to do. Um, but primarily, we're kind of interested in stimulating, you know, the UK's innovation economy overall. We know that uh, economies that invest in innovation heavily as percentage of GDP show more growth and the UK overall is quite low down there just in terms of you know the people we compete against you know USA China Germany France we're not investing as much in innovation in the economy as they are so what we want to do is kind of we see our role is to boost that innovation and turn that into real kind of tangible sort of benefit and uplift to the economy but yeah basically to get back to the question the money's not repayable but there are different types of funding in terms of percentages so yeah. we might 60 percent 50 percent 40 percent fund depending on the nature of the call or the funding. Thank you. Yeah, um, there's probably two, two points I'd uh, like to make. I mean, in terms of European funding, it's actually, you're, you're probably already accessing it. Uh, if you're on the accelerated growth programme, or going to be on the accelerated growth programme, European funding. If you've uh, accessed funding from Finance Wales through Jeremy, European funding. So there's, there's a number of uh, funding streams that are go through Welsh government schemes, uh, university schemes, training schemes that you're accessing already as businesses or, or should be looking to access. So that the money is there, there's also procurement opportunities. So that, that's the sort of structural fund side of things. And, and it's the key point that we're trying to do is we're trying to link that activity that's always happened in Wales. And it, and it touches on some of the points that were made earlier. What we're trying to do is, is, is move businesses on from being lifestyle businesses to growth businesses that can access funding from uh, whether it be Finance Wales or, or other risk capital. So we're trying to grow these businesses and move them along a, a journey and that's where the stairway to excellence. Now in my particular area it's research and innovation so I'm focused on Horizon 2020 as one of those exemplar areas where you have to be European class, your idea has to be European class, your business has to be European class as well. But there are steps along the way um, and there are schemes, as Simon has said, we, the, this, this is, uh, used to be very much a, a higher education kind of club. It's very much an innovation club now, very much a business club. If you're the right business, there are people out there who are actually crying out for you to join their, their partnership. And those are some of the quick wins that we're trying to join up. And, and this is an area we're working on with, with KTN, with the uh, National Contact Points, who are experts that work as part of Innovate UK. And we're also working in Wales as uh, joining across with what the universities are trying to do, what Welsh Government innovation teams are trying to do with the, the businesses they've made, se made, made several investments in. And then also we're working in specific uh, geographical and sectorial areas. So Innovation Point is already a conversation we've had. And that's something where, for example, we have Score Cymru funding, which is £10,000, up to £10,000 to help write your bid for these, for these uh, uh, funding, uh, like Horizon. Um, and it would be the innovation point would look to access that and work with the businesses to, to access that. So we're joining up there. There's also activity happening in the uh, health department as well. So you've got Nick Beatty who has his experience as an evaluator for Horizon 2020. He's trying to gear the health service and the opportunities there, e-health, etc. So again, there'll be business opportunities there and we're looking to join those together. So it's really the wiring behind, behind the background. The, the, I was going to say, the lovely thing about this money is that it's non-dilutive, okay? It doesn't eat up your shares. And that's a very, very key point. And I can tell you when I started Ubiquity, I set a goal in the early days of every pound of equity I bought in, I had it matched with a pound of money from somewhere else. It makes a huge difference. Kieran, you might want to just say how, what kind of effect that has on someone who's trying to crowdsource We've had quite a few businesses that have secured pretty substantial grants from the likes of Innovate UK that's been mentioned, like forming the Tech Technology Strategy Board, and any business that has been through that process, which 
Um, I think what well, generally grants and that kind of non-dilutative investment is very, very tough to, to secure. So if you've been through that process, our investors really see that as a point of validation. Um, so definitely I couldn't agree more. If you're able to secure some uh, grant funding and then you use that to top, well, you basically to, to top up what you're going, especially on the match funding side of stuff. So if you're able to, whatever it is, I don't know, 30, 70, 50, 50 uh, match funding, to be able to use our platform to, to secure your match, because typically you'll be given um, uh, a period of time, maybe it's four, six months, uh, during which time you have to secure that much funding to open, uh, open up the grant. I think that's a really, really interesting um, area that yeah, we'd love to, to explore. So if that's something you're looking at, please do grab me afterwards. Happy to talk you through that. Thank you. I mean, Garrett, you might want to just, you mentioned that you, you, you know, Horizon 2020 needs to be European quality stuff. Trust me, there's plenty of European quality stuff in Wales. Um, you know, I travel around Europe and I see some stuff and we should be embarrassed about nothing about in terms of our base of IP and talent. Uh, I'd like to now throw it open to the audience if you've got questions. There's a question there. There's a roving mic. If you wait for the mic, just say who you are and uh, give us your question, please. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is uh, Neil Wylands. I'm the CEO of uh, a new startup based up in North Wales. So please don't forget <laughs> us. Um, uh, it's a spin-off company, a uh, SaaS uh, product that I've spun off from a business that I've, I founded 18 years ago. Um, we're, we're in a very interesting situation. We've got a, a product that we developed about two and a half um, years ago. Um, it's uh, just with one single user. It's uh, generated about over 11 million page views. There's, I've got a list of stats here that I can re read out to you that you'd all, I'm sure, would be impressed with. Um, we're rolling it out now. I've identified that this uh, is a product that um, can roll out both nationally and possibly globally. So uh, very ambitious from that point of view. Um, we're bootstrapping it at the moment. So we've managed to rebuild the product um, and the MVP should be launched end of July, um, which will allow multiple organizations and multiple users. We, we built it for a specific user, but we own the IP. Um, while, while bootstrapping this MVP, we've also been looking at funding. We've been to Finance Wales, and we are outside of their um, risk matrix, I think their wording was. Uh, we've engaged with um, uh, whoever it is, giving it for some kind of grant, well, assembly government. Uh, a bit too slow for us. We've got half a dozen people before we've even launched this, before we even started marketing it, really, banging on the door wanting to use it. So it, it, it's, it's kind of... We've almost made a decision that, that the delay in applying for a grant could actually hinder the growth of the business. Um, but we do need help. So obviously, there's a few other things open there that I'm particularly interested in, Innovate UK and the Horizon 2020, which I'm going to go and do some research on. But um, I suppose, I mean, I've probably got an abundance of questions. I mean, obviously, in North Wales... Um, one of the issues we certainly will have is recruiting um, more developers. We're looking at probably taking our team up to, to four, as it is now, up to about 24 in a very fast um, period of time. Um, so skills is, is a difficult one. Uh, we've been offered, uh, VCs have said, we'll definitely support this, but you're going to have to move out of the area, out of Wales even, which we don't want to do. We're, all, we're a Welsh company. I've had a business in Wales for nearly 20 years now. Uh, North Wales, that is, by the way. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I just, I suppose, my, no specific question, but maybe where do I go next? Crowdfunding is definitely on the agenda as well, but I, I'd be interested to know, from my research, there's not a lot of success with websites, if you like, um, software in crowdfunding. It, it seems to be more product-led, particularly on, uh, maybe the equity one is a slightly different um, but yeah, just you your thoughts. Where do I go there? next? Yeah, so I, th I think you're right there. There's plenty of those kind of very consumer focused platforms like so Kickstarter and Indiegogo, and they're, they're more focused on the rewards based uh, side of stuff, which is great if you've got a new product you're trying to get off the ground and validate and get it into the hands of the people that you want using it. But I'd say for equity crowdfunding and Crowdcube, um, Yes, consumer-focused businesses do still perform very, very well, but ultimately our investors are looking for a decent investment opportunity regardless of the sector. So I'd um, love to speak to you afterwards and see, see whether or not 
we could help, which I hope we can. So. Just on the skills, uh, a point worth making is downstairs you'll see the National Software Academy have a stand. That's an initiative that's desperately needed, and I'll tell you why. If you add up all the comp science students coming out of the Federation of Welsh Universities, it's around 300 historically. We need 3,000 to stand still in the economy. 70% of those 300 students are vacuumed into London and the South East. So the points that uh, Ian Livingstone was making were very well founded. And uh, Terry Matthews and I were asked by the Treasury to come up with a series of recommendations for the budget. One of them that we put forward was that the, the government considered treating skills in the same way that they treat R&D. And what we mean by that is, if you do R&D, as you know, you're eligible for an R&D tax credit. I, I would contend that skills are even more important than R&D. And so the government should give a skills tax credit to every company that pays the fees of any undergraduate or postgraduate student in the UK. And when you think about it, it's neutral because they're already paying for it out of the student loan company. But it would increase the relationship between government and uh, between employers and universities. Students who otherwise would be disenfranchised because of cost could go to university, so it widens access. There's a lot of good reasons for it, but we do have to do something about this skills issue. And if you get a chance, go down and talk to the, the, the National Software Academy because they're looking for partnerships, particularly in industry. There's a question uh, there. Hi, it's um, Steve from DevOps Guys. We're a um, Cardiff-based uh, SME. We're a services company, not a product company. You sound that's... like you're from Merthyr Tidville, is that right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm slightly, slightly south yeah. of there. <laughs> Unfortunately, James, my business partner, has the really good Welsh accent, isn't here. Um, I think number four on your list of reasons why um, uh, SMEs fail was around cash flow. A lot of the conversation has been aimed at equity funding. I mean, I look at our company, we're cash generative, we're, we're, we're profitable, but like all SMEs, we have a cash flow problem. And it really irks me that we're potentially in a situation that I've got to give equity away in my business just to overcome a cash flow shortfall. Any suggestions around that? Because we all know the banks are useless. Invoice factoring is, is potentially an option, but why do I want to give my entire sort of accounts payable, accounts receivable over to, to Hitachi Finance who want to rip me off as well. Any suggestions around how do we solve the cash flow problem, not just the equity funding David, problem? David, you do that one? So there's quite a lot of innovation in terms of crowdfunding around uh, working capital finance. So there's a, a platform called Platform Black, which is will help companies with, with um, cash flow issues. And, and, and there you can actually sell a single invoice. You don't have to have a long-term relationship. So there's also other sites like, uh, like Cashflow as well, which, which provide uh, working capital finance. I mean, at its heart, that should be something, particularly debt of finance, should be something that, that is relatively straightforward to, to fund because it's backed by the asset of the, of the debtor. So I think there are a number of options out there. And one of the things that is unfortunate, actually, is that the public sector generally don't regard working capital as something that they'll support. So by and large, going for, for grant funding or anything around that is, is tricky. But I, I would certainly have a, have a look at some of the sites like Platform Black cash flow and so on, because I think you'll find that actually they, uh, they could uh, meet your requirements. Thanks. Thank you. Another question? Over here? And then at the back. Oh, the other way around. <laughs> we'll come to Morning. you. Um, Morning. My name is Matt Shepley. Um, I'm based up in North Wales. I'm director of an uh, alternative funding consultancy. What do you think, can I open the question over to the panel, what do you think um, about the facilitation of information on alternative funding, non-bank funding to businesses as a whole? What do you think of the, um, or how do you think that, how do you think we could improve um, information that's available to businesses on non-bank funding? Yeah, so you, I remember at the start of this year there was a, a government survey uh, YouGov, and I think it said around 50% of people are aware of crowdfunding and alternative finance, and I think it was 14% have actually used one of these platforms. For SMEs, it's something like 45% of SMEs have 
heard about alternative finance and crowdfunding and only 9% have used it. So clearly massive uh, opportunity here, I suppose, for the old alternative finance sector. But then as you're kind of pointing out, how are you going to get uh, people more aware of it? So um, there's a couple of trade bodies that I think are trying to, to promote that within the press and policymakers and within the public. And uh, just coming to that first question before, they also list um, all the different members for these. So there's the peer-to-peer Finance Association, which is great to find out about all the different models that are out there, and then the UK Crowdfunding Association, um, which yeah promote what they're doing within uh, various events and um, policy proposals as well, which is probably not the best way to, to raise awareness within the public. But I think the nature of crowdfunding alternative finance, it taps into the news and social media, so hopefully, kind of organically, people will become slowly more, more aware of it as more and more people engage in and start doing those kinds of projects. Um, I guess also there's that piece on uh, kind of signposting, so biz, uh, banks, which I know there's a fair bit of lobbying going on at the moment, so something like 250,000 businesses each year are turned down by banks um, to, to secure loans. Where are they being signposted to? Alternative finance platforms is a great, great kind of opportunity for for many, if not some, of those businesses. So I guess formally, um, almost forcing uh, banks and other more traditional sources of finance to signpost those businesses that they're not able to serve at this time to uh, loan-based crowdfunding platforms, to the to the invoice financing platforms, platform back market invoice, um, and other equity platforms, and even rewards-based platforms as well. Um, but I think. Over time, I mean, it's very, very early days for the alternative finance sector. It's been really going since 2005 or so in the UK and really just started to, to gain momentum over the last couple of years. So I do see it as early days and the more people that are out there talking about it in the news, in the social media, um, hopefully that is going to raise awareness organically. And the more successes we see, the more businesses using it um, and making, well, clearly demonstrate that it is a really valuable and viable and proven way to raise money, then those kind of, uh, that reputation will hopefully continue to build. Um, Thank you. Mark, do you have a quick point? Because we are pushed yeah, for time now. Quickly. Um, just on that note of kind of non-bank finance, um, Knowledge Transfer Network, and particularly my team, Creative Digital Design, they, uh, we publish monthly a digest um, called Creative and Digital Business Briefing, which is essentially a breakdown of all the kind of finance offers that we are able to kind of get our hands on. We publish it regularly, we update it regularly, and we scour um, sort of industry and finance sources to keep that up to date. It's a really good kind of resource if you're looking to go for kind of non-VC funding or non-bank funding um, and we also sort of signpost to VCs that we're engaged with um, and you know we, we, it's there and it's quite useful so give me a shout if you haven't seen it and you want to sign up. Thank you very much. We need to wrap up so uh, but grab anybody on the, on the panel as, as you leave if you've got additional questions. One point I would make particularly for people who are starting companies, the stock market is looking very expensive. Put your money in the bank and you get nothing in terms of interest. So you'd be well advised, and we, we advise all our startups to do this, to put out a quarterly report to your friends, to your family, and to their contacts. And you describe how your company's going. The more visibility you give people of how your company's doing and the progress it's making, the more easier it is to ask them for money. When you just turn up cold and say, can I have some money, you, you, you're going to have it a hard time. Make a glorious sound about your businesses. Get a newsletter going. You know, strip out the acronyms, because we live in a very difficult uh, technology uh, area, and turn it into a saga. And people will be engaged. I guarantee you. One of the things I've watched Terry Matthews do all his life is every 12 weeks put out a newsletter. Um, his, his circulation is like 30,000 or something. <laughs> but... Um, People are never surprised and they're informed and it helps them to make a decision. Listen, thank you very much. I'd like to thank the panel and perhaps you join me in thanking them.